Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andy Grand, the Assistant Director of the Center for International Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this installment of our year-long series, Global Inequalities, the Conditions and Consequences of Social and Natural Disparity. As we all know, recent transformations within the global economy from increased neoliberal reform and the dismantling of the social welfare state to manufacturing-driven growth in the global south have resulted in a massive respatialization of wealth and poverty, adding new dimensions to one of the world's oldest problems, inequality. Through this series, CIS and the Program on the Global Environment investigate the character and experience of inequality today. Upcoming talks will feature anthropologist Anne Allison on economic precarity and loneliness in Japan, and historian Gyanendra Pandey on caste discrimination and racism in India and the United States, respectively. We hope to see you at all of these future events. Today, with the generous help of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, we are thrilled to welcome Lawrence Ralph back to the University of Chicago to discuss his recent book, Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland, Gangland Chicago, which was published last year by the University of Chicago Press. Based on research conducted in a neighborhood on Chicago's west side, this beautifully written ethnography moves past fixed ideas on inner city poverty and crime, those that currently dominate policy circles, to instead examine how experiences of injury shape the lives, dreams, and politics of the neighborhood's varied residents. Lawrence Ralph is an assistant professor in the departments of anthropology and African and African American studies at Harvard University. Previously, he held the Mandela Rodney Du Bois postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan Center for African and Afro-American Studies. In the academic year 2012 to 2013, he was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. His scholarly work explores how the historical circumstances of police abuse, mass incarceration, and the drug trade naturalized disease, disability, and premature death for urban residents. His research has appeared in Anthropological Theory, Disability Studies Quarterly, Transition and Identities, Global Studies, and Culture and Power. Lawrence earned his PhD and MA here uh, uh, at the University of Chicago in anthropology, and he holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology, where he majored in history, technology, and society. And on a personal note, uh, I, I just need to say I have the pleasure of knowing Lawrence since our shared days as graduate students here at the university. It was thus with special joy that I read Renegade Dreams, uh, and it really is an extraordinary and important book, uh, one that combines poetry and politics caring critique unlike few others. Uh, I'm thus especially pleased to be able to welcome Lawrence to the university today. Just one quick note on the event format. Uh, after Lawrence uh, speaks, there will be time for questions from the audience. Uh, after the Q&A period, we will adjourn outside these doors to the lobby uh, where wine and other refreshments await and where the Seminary Co-op bookstore will offer copies of Renegade Dreams on sale. Uh, we encourage you all to join us for the reception and the book signing. Uh, now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Ralph. Thank you, Andy, for that warm introduction. And um, I would like to thank the Center for International Studies for inviting me to Chicago, inviting me back to the University of Chicago, and giving me this opportunity to share my work. The talk that I want to give today is from the book, Renegade Dreams, and it's entitled, The Injury of Nostalgia. At the West Side Juvenile Detention Center, inmates never notice your face. It's almost like you don't have one. When you walk into a cell block at recreation time, the attention moves quickly to your shoes. They watch you walk to figure out why you came. I imagine what goes through their heads. Navy blue leather boots, reinforced steel toes, at least size 12, must be a guard. The glass door swings open again. Expensive brown wingtips, creased khakis cover the tongue. A Northwestern law student come to talk about legal rights. Yep. Mr. Gregory wears old shoes. Still the cheap patent leather shines and after sitting in the waiting room for nearly an hour and a half, the squeak of his wingtips as he comes to take me back is a relief. I've been coming here for years now, he says, explaining his weekly visits as a Bible study instructor. 
It's a shame, but you can just tell which ones have their mothers and fathers at home. Most of these kids don't. You sit around and listen to them talk. All they talk about is selling drugs and gym shoes. Though I do generally don't agree with what Mr. Gregory has to say about today's young people, his comments today warrant a nod of acknowledgement. His observations are, if not quite accurate, at least astute. There is a revealing relationship between jail clothes and gym shoes, and gang renegades are at the center of it. Until recently, Mr. Gregory couldn't tell you what a gang renegade was. I know because I educated him on the topic when he heard the gang tossing the term around for sport. Renegades, I tell him, are young gang affiliates, typically teenagers. Seasoned members claim that they don't have the wherewithal to be in the gang. According to their leaders, renegades are the reason why the gang is not functioning as it should. What I don't tell Mr. Gregory is this. The way in which older gang members see renegades is similar to how church leaders like himself, not to mention prison guards, teachers, and even scholars, view the urban poor more generally. Chicago's renegade problem, in other words, is a parable for how we see the urban poor. And what follows, I want to complicate the assumptions that many have made about the structure, decisions, and perspective of renegades by examining the sub subjective versions of a contested and contestable gang history. Examining the, fraught, the gang's fraught past in the Chicago community called Eastwood will then help us to understand the problems of the present. In the midst of unprecedented rates of incarceration, the anxiety that gang members harbor about the future of their organization are projected onto the youngest generation of members and onto the globally circulated objects they consume and create. For gang members who are currently 40 to 60 years old, the emergence of gym shoes signaled the end of an era when affiliates pursued grassroots initiatives and involved themselves in local protest movements. Meanwhile, for the other cohort of gang members who came of age during the war on drugs, those currently 25 to 40 years old, gym shoes connote an era, an era of rampant heroin trafficking. As they remember it, this was a moment that translated into exorbitant profits. That these oldest two generations of divine knights hanker for a centralized gang structure where authority was more clearly ordered places an enormous amount of pressure on the youngest generational cohort, gang members currently aged 15 to 25. Hence, we'll see that just like the game of shoe charades that inmates play in jail, renegades and the footwear they wear yield key insights about a person's place in the world. The renegade shoes are important cultural icons in present day Eastwood. Within the Divine Knights organization, wearing the latest pair of sneakers is seen as the first status marker in the life and career of a gang member. From the time a person joins a gang, having a fashionable pair of sneakers establishes a person as a well-established affiliate. As a gang member, after you reach your late te teens or 20s, success is measured by whether you can afford a nice car or your own apartment. But since most teenagers they call renegades have yet to matriculate to this stage, having a fashionable pair of gym shoes is the pinnacle of possession. Even though their gang leaders claim that nowadays the fashion trends of young gang members are too beholden to mainstream dictates, that their style is no longer definitively the Divine Knight's own, gym shoes are the badge of prestige that renegades covet most. Young renegades find numerous categories and distinctions to parse between various shoes. They speculate how, about how exclusive a person's shoes are, whether or not they can be purchased in ubiquitous commercial outlets like Foot Locker or only in signature boutiques, or if they are retro models from another era. And the more colors and textures that are woven onto the canvas of one shoe, the better. To be, shoe, to be sure, renegades in Eastwood hold similar opinions of footwear as teenagers all over the country urban and suburban alike, gang member or not. But despite the fact that the kind of shoes renegades buy have gained a reputation in broader society through the dominance of market capitalism and in particular, the prevalence of hip hop culture, 
One cannot reduce the suburban white students and the black urban gang members' predilection towards gym shoes to the same rudimentary obsession. In a community like Eastwood, where 75% of males between the age of 15 and 45 have a criminal record, and 57% of all women and men have been incarcerated, the stakes are simply higher for the poor black gang member and sneakers far more integral to the life of teenagers who have far fewer possessions and on a broader level, far fewer possibilities. When it comes to the Divine Knights, gym shoes signal a host of contradictions entailed in gang nostalgia, since gang members from the pre-renegade era can recall down to the year, sometimes even the day that they purchase the same model of shoes that they see young renegades currently wearing. That these older gang members hypocritically hassle renegades for possessing the same consumer fetishes that they had, bolsters the point that at present, Gym shoes have accrued another additional symbolic value. They've come to stand in for uncertainties about the future. The problem is that gym shoes, like many gang symbols, have a double quality. They articulate highly charged notions of social mobility for one generation and for another generation, simultaneously recall cohesion and nostalgia. The sentiment of nostalgia has been used to connect forms of social injury to the physical reality of the body almost from the beginning. The term was invented by a Swiss doctor, Johannes Ofer, in his medical dissertation. It describes a longing for a home that no longer exists or that has never existed. Among the first to become debilitated by and diagnosed with the disease, were Swiss soldiers who were hired out to fight, to fight in the French Revolution. Upon returning home, the soldiers were struck with nausea, loss of appetite, pathological changes in the lungs, brain inflammation, cardiac arrest, high fever, and the propensity for suicide. Among nostalgia's most lingering symptoms was an ability to see ghosts. To, be, to cure this sickness, doctors described anything from a swift trip to the Swiss Alps to having leeches pulled and then implanted from the skin to a healthy dose of opium, but nothing seemed to work. The experience of ensuing errors only confirmed the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of a cure. By the end of the 18th century, the meaning of nostalgia had shifted from a curable individual sickness to an incurable historical emotion. The burdens of nostalgia and the weight of its historical emotion are very much still with us. Interrupting the present with incessant flashes from the past, nostalgia retroactively reformulates cause and effect. Nostalgia refigures our linear ideas of history. We can't see much on nights like this, but that doesn't stop us from sitting on the stoop and watching the corner. The lights on Mr. Otis's street either don't work or are never on. In fact, they wouldn't serve any purpose at all except for the police camera at the street, except for the lamppost at the street's end, excuse me, provides a mount for the police camera. The device rests on a white box topped with a neon blue half sphere that lights up every few seconds. Residents dismissively refer to it as the blue light. Stationed to surveil the neighborhood, the blue light fulfills another unintended purpose. In the absence of working street lights, the intermittent flash almost illuminates the entire street. It is, a, it is a vague luminescence, but just enough to make out the molded wood boards of the vacant houses across the street. You can also dis discern occasional trash bags blowing in the weed, like blowing in the wind like urban tumbleweed. And you can spot the t-shirts, everyone in white tees. But that's about all the blue light at the end of the street allows us to see from a porch in the middle. From where we sit, you can't discern the owners of those t-shirts. Their faces aren't perceptible, not even the lim their limbs. Just clusters of white t-shirts floating in the distance, like ghosts. From Mr. Otis's perspective, a 72-year-old veteran of both Eastwood Stoops and Eastwood's oldest gangs, 
These ghosts are a fleeting image of the good old gang about to sink into oblivion. As Mr. Otis sits, his slight hunchback angles him forward. He watches the street intently as if he's being paid for the task, and in a sense he is. Central to his work as a counselor at the local violence prevention program is to attend to the comings and goings of the street. His credentials, however, are far more valuable than anything he can see from this stoop. Mr. Otis was one of the first members to join the nascent gang in the 1950s during the second great migration when African Americans moved from the South to Chicago and settled in European immigrant neighborhoods. Back then, black youths traveled for camaraderie and to navigate streets whose residents resented their presence. Since they were known to fight their white peers for access to recreational spaces, the popular image of the black gang emerged as a group of delinquents. <coughs> Mr. Otis became a leader of the gang in the 1960s by the time he was 26 and has rena remained prominent in both Eastwood and the community for the next 40 years. Nowadays, M Mr. Otis speaks of the gang with the mix of fondness and disdain. The two great narratives of his life, community decline and gang devolution, are also interwoven. See, things were different when we were on the block, Mr. Otis continues. We did things for the community. We picked up trash. We even had a motto, where there was glass, there will be grass. He sings whimsically. And white folks couldn't believe it. The media, they were shocked. Channel 5 and 7 came around here, put us on the TV screen for picking up bottles. In these lively reminiscences, Mr. Otis connects the Divine Knights Community Service Initiatives to the political struggles of the Civil Rights Movement. When he was a youngster, Otis was part of the gang that claimed they wanted to end criminal activity. They hoped their gang could be known for political activism instead. At, the, at around the same time, in the mid-1960s, a radical new thesis articulated by criminologists in the prison reform movement gained momentum. These researchers argued that people turned to crime because social institutions had largely failed them. Major street gangs became recipients of private grants and public funds, most notably from President Johnson's war on poverty, to do community organizations, develop social welfare programs, and to enter into for-profit businesses. The Divine Knights of the 1960s opened up community centers, reform schools, and a number of small businesses and management programs. Such possibilities were in full bloom when Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. relocated his family into a home near Eastwood. In June of 1966, the Divine Knights were persuaded to participate in two marches Dr. King led into all white neighborhoods during Chicago's open housing campaign. Inspired by the movement's demand that the Chicago City Council increase garbage collection, street cleaning services, and building inspection services in urban areas, the Divites organized their own platform. They scheduled a press conference with local media outlets to unveil their agenda on April 4th, 1968. King was assassinated just before the cameras arrived. Hours later, Eastwood burst into riots. The fires and looting that followed King's murder destroyed many of the establishments along Murphy Road, Eastwood's main thoroughfare. Many store owners left the neighborhood when insurance companies canceled their policies or increased their premiums, premiums, making it difficult to rebuild their businesses in their previous locations. This cycle of disinvestment affected all of Eastwood's retailers. By 1970, 75% of the businesses that had buoyed the community just two decades earlier were shuttered. There has not been a significant migration of people or jobs into Eastwood since World War II. In the decades after the massive fire and looting, Mr. Otis and other gang elders insist the Divine Knights lost most of their power because they could do little to stop other factions from rioting. Neighborhood residents not affiliated with the gang were likewise dismayed, believing that King's murder proved that the injustices the Divine Knights alleged to be fighting were in fact intractable. From Mr. Otis's perspective, the disillusionment that accompanied King's death and the riots that followed, not to mention the other assassinations, such, that, such, as, that, as, such as that of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton, ensured a downward spiral. 
The stunning promise of the civil rights era was shattered. Its decline as awful as its rise was glorious. As I sit and listen to Mr. Otis, I notice how his nostalgia for a political gang is a yearning for the past as much as it is a desire for a different present. His lamentations about the contemporary state of the gang include uh, don't include structural changes in the American social order. The, the bad decisions that the gang made are, are reduced to their own um, inability to plan for the future. Mr. Otis and gang members of his generation failed to acknowledge that the gang's latter-day embrace of the drug economy was not a simple matter of choice. The riots that marked the end, the riots also marked the end of the financial assistance for street organizations that wanted to engage in community activism. The reality that the gang was, in fact, renowned for petty crime and feared for its revolutionary potential is cleansed in the romantic history that Mr. Otis resurrects in which he invokes civilized marches along the same streets that are now dusty and vacant. In his telling, there is no mention that even during the civil rights heyday, there were gang members who were not at all civic-minded, or that a substantial number of gangs were still occupied by their own selfish and parochial concerns. Whether or not this glorious conception of the political gang persists, or even if it never exists in the way Mr. Otis imagines, it is deployed nevertheless. And so it is like a shiny surveillance technology that transforms a person's face into a specter at night. The civil rights colored lens through which Mr. Otis views the gang helps fashion the image that haunts him. In Eastwood, the passionate longing associated with nostalgia is not unique to politically oriented gang elders. The following generation is beset by a devotion to the same era that Mr. Otis views as the beginning of the end. The interview unfolds on a West Side Chicago barbershop as Red Walker, the short, stocky, tattoo blanketed leader of the Divine Knights, reminisces about what it has been like to grow up in the gang. He has been a member of the Knights since he was nine years old. Now as a captain of the gang set, Red feels that his organization's biggest problem is a lack of leadership. He compares the gang of old to the one he now commands. And this comparison begins with a rant on gang nostalgia. Obama, really? Red says as he watches the boy he employs to sweep up loose clouds of hair. I mean, I ain't got nothing against the brother. He's black, he's from the shy. But I ain't going to be walking around here with Obama's shoes on like the campaign is paying me. It's the fall of 2007, and Red is referring to the then potential nominee's face as it, as it has appeared in hologram form on one of the most fashionable sneakers some of the young renegades wear, Nike Air Force Ones. I don't know what Obama's going to do if he does become president, but I know this. He can't do much. See, when I was his age, he continues, again referring to the teenager that has now left. The gang was my nation. We were a nation of knights. I ain't wear no red, white, and blue sneakers with no politician's face on them. Nah, we kept it plain and simple. Our flag was orange and blue. Taking advantage of Red's nostalgia, I ask him about the differences between his and the latest generation of the Divine Knights. Mr. Otis, that's my neighbor, I say to Red. You call these young boys renegades. You say they only care about gym shoes, but he told me that you guys were the same way when you were younger. He said you were good and crazy. When he hears this comment, Red switches off his clippers. Yeah, we were crazy, he says. But you know what the difference is? We were some close-knit crazy folks. He puts his clippers on the countertop. We used to wear colors. Remember that? What happened to colors, he says, He's questioning no one in particular. All of my clothes were orange and blue, from head to toe, he says. We used to cock our hats to the side. What happened to that, huh? When we rocked those expensive jewels, when we had on name brand clothes and new shoes, it meant that we earned it. We all looked fly because we all got money together. We got it together. He picks back up his clippers and waves them at me. See, man, that's the difference. And you can tell Mr. Otis, I said it. 
As Red reminisces about cocking his hat to the side while clad in his orange and blue uniform, the, flat, the fact that he is bothered because one of his workers wears Obama Nikes demonstrates the potency of the gym shoe as a historical symbol. For Red, gym shoes conjure a time when the gang leaders commanded a centralized structure in Eastwood where every person knew his place. He fails to acknowledge that since his childhood, social transformations have contributed to the demise of the gang's centralized form. The present day demise of the 1980s gang structure can only be understood in the context that gave rise to it. The Divine Knights gang emerged as a fully fledged drug dealing enterprise in the late 1970s and 1980s, when the void left by the Italian mafia and the lack of police presence in the inner city presented the opportunity for them to mobilize around the drug trade. This was also around the time when the national economy contracted. In a climate in which bustling factories turned into empty steel labyrinths, joblessness was tied to crime, and the specter of urban violence became potent in the American imagination. As politicians spread images of inner city danger, the specter of black crime seemed to justify the logic that longer and more severe drug penalties could curb street violence. As segments of the urban poor became increasingly visible, their very presence motivated a crackdown in urban communities inaugurated by Ronald Reagan and continued by Presidents Bush and Clinton. A number of scholars have pointed out that during the 1980s and 1990s, it's possible to note the extent to which crime rates actually increased. One of the ironies of this period is that the growing politicization of crime itself contributed to higher reporting rates. In the last few decades, as government agencies have begun taking reliable records, we've learned that violent crime has actually declined in the United States since 1993. And as this downward spiral has continued into the new millennium, still, members of Red's generation have been greatly impacted by drug legislation. From the time Red joined the gang in 1988 to the time he went to prison 10 years later for a two-year drug-related bid, the prison population in Illinois increased by 138%. This number pales in comparison to the 400% rise specific to drug offenders during that same stretch. In 1988, when Red was around the same age as the renegades he now rebukes, Drug offenses made up less than 17% of all prison sentences in Illinois. In 1999, Red's final year in prison, drug offenses accounted for 40%. The next year when Red was promoted to gang leader, 29% of all inmates locked up in the state of Illinois were from Eastwood. The 13,000 Eastwood residents Red left behind when he was released weren't all gang members. Yet the legislation passed by pointing to the drug problem had the consequence of transforming their community, Eastwood, into a prison pipeline. Hence, whether he fully acknowledges it or not, Red's nostalgia for a golden era is not exclusively about his gang or a diminished ethic of collective hustling. It's about an entire generation of adults exiled from the neighborhood through the scapegoat of urban violence. Nostalgia that cunning historical emotion has inverted cause and effect once again. Renegades are seen as responsible for the neighborhood's ills as opposed to their precarious, precarious subject position resulting from them. But while seasoned gang members rearticulate the past to make sense of an anxiety-filled present, renegades, renegades literally refashion the circumstances and objects of the present to make sense of a vastly uncertain future. I consider it an ethnographic coup when I realized that eight months into my time in Eastwood, several key leaders in local schools, churches, and gang prevention agencies have become familiar with my research. Even if the practitioners of these organizations do not know the full extent of my work, many are aware that it involves gangs. Monique, a youth worker at Eastwood Community Church, asked me one day 
if I would be interested in talking to students at Brown High as part of career day. Once I agreed, she informed me that I will be in a classroom full of sophomores who the administration has tagged as gang members. The morning of career day is crisp and blue. After a continental breakfast of bagels, muffins, and hot coffee, I make my way up a concrete staircase to room 208, where two white male teachers greet me. One, Mr. Flynn, looks to be in his mid-20s. The other, Mr. Drake, is a bit older. As we enter the room, 30 unimpressed eyes turn to stare at three professional black men, an anthropologist, a corporate attorney, and a probation officer. After the older teacher, Mr. Drake, more or less successfully gets the attention of the class, Mr. Randall, the probation officer, begins. I work for Cook County, Cook County Courts, he says. Every day, I deal with kids that look like you. One boy is sitting directly in front of Mr. Randall, drawing on his desk in a loopy cursive with his pencil eraser. As soon as his ears catch the word you, he bristles. What did you say? He responds abrasively. No, not you. I'm not talking about you specifically, Randall apologizes. I'm talking about you in the sense that they are from, your, from this neighborhood and they are around your age. Also, they're black. Finding this a sufficient answer, the scribbler, whose name I later find out is Jamel, responds with a dismissive but affirmative head nod. One of the things I oversee is an educational program in a juvenile detention center. Oh, you mean Jumpstart, Jamel interjects, almost involuntarily. Yeah, you been there? Mr. Randall asks. Um, no, Jamel mumbles, looking around nervously but some of my friends have. Well, hopefully you won't have to go there, Mr. Randall says, but if you do, you can still get an education. Another thing I do, he continues, is monitor home incarceration. Do any of you know what that is? House arrest. Two kids from opposite ends of the class chime in simultaneously. Yeah, that's right. And I'm gonna, tell you, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, he leans forward, cupping the right side of his mouth. Probation officers who monitor people on house arrest are off every other weekend and on the holidays. Do what you want to do with that information. <laughs> the class erupts. Students begin bouncing on the edge of their plastic seats. Oh, man. So which weekend will they come, a boy asks. <laughs> He's been staring out of the window until now. It don't matter, says one, another. If they come one weekend, you know they're off the next, right? He replies, begging for confirmation. That's right, Randall says. Man, what's your name? Danny, the boy replies. That's right, Danny. Just then, the younger teacher, Mr. Flynn, informs the class that this would usually be the time when students can ask questions. But we'll have to save that for later, he says, because we're behind schedule. Right now, we'll move straight into the activity period. In the light of the 2008 political season, the teachers decide to hold a classroom debate. The younger teacher opens an envelope and takes out a sheet of paper. He reads the debate topic from it. Jay-Z is more powerful than Barack Obama, is the first topic. The teenagers are initially hesitant to take sides, so the 30-something-year-old teacher, Mr. Drake, begins by arguing in favor of rapper Jay-Z. You guys know all of his songs. You know everything about him. You don't know hardly anything about Barack or what he stands for. Last night was the 19th presidential debate. Who has seen a debate so far? All of the adults raise their hands, but none of the kids do. Exactly. I asked you earlier, and you guys didn't even know what his wife's name was. But what's Jay-Z's real name? Sean Carter, the kids say in unison. Who's his wife? Beyonce, they say in rhythm. See what I mean? Mr. Drake says, smiling. But I think Barack is more powerful, Danny says, interrupting his teacher's happy experiment. Because he's trying to be president. Jay-Z's just trying to be rich. And plus, Barack, he got plans and stuff for how to improve our lives. He tells us about change, how to change the world, you know? All Jay-Z tells us about is how to hustle, how to sell drugs, how to live in the hood, which we already know, he says, gesturing towards the window. 
But Jay-Z got clothing lines, Jamel intervenes. He got a record label, he produces movies, he got a restaurant, he got his own shoes. In making his case, he gestures towards another student's feet, which are adorned with pearl white S. Dot Carter's, Jay-Z's signature shoe. People in the hood, we want that. We want to dress like Jay-Z, eat what he eats, be on his label. But Jay-Z is a rapper, Danny roars. A rapper can never be as powerful as the president. The president can raise taxes, lower taxes. A president can send us to war, make us go in the draft. A president can send Jay-Z to war if he wants to, <laughs> Danny says. If we get evicted, what's Jay-Z going to do? When you're living in your car that don't have no gas and don't work, can't even turn on the radio, how are you going to listen to Jay-Z then? <laughs> what then, huh? The, the room goes silent. Danny for president, Mr. Randall yells out. <laughs> After a few more activities, complete with the school assembly and a keynote speaker, Monique and I leave Brown High School through the parking lot. One student, looking out of the window from the school's top floor, yells, goodbye now, have a nice day. He's talking in the nasal voice that black comedians used in exaggerated imitations of white people. Another student, switching to his actual voice howls. Now get in your car and drive home. And don't come back, blasts another. Hey, man, hey, 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 is that your girl? One continues to heckle while we walk stoic and unconvincing, unconvincingly deaf. You hear me talking to you, man. Why don't you get in the fuck out of here? Bye bye now, another says, returning to his uptight white person's voice. As we left career day just a few minutes earlier, I had felt a small blossom of nostalgia. I remembered why I had been drawn to education as a teenager. The times when unexpected lessons from strangers became more fulfilling than what I was learning in history books. This created me a sense that I could amend what I was being taught with a more experiential understanding of how the world worked. Although most of the time it seemed that the kids were barely listening to me throughout the day, I felt a palpable sense of accomplishment. The windows, window hecklers, however, quickly deflate my pride. And yet, I am more surprised by the heckler's resentment than I should have been. These students, flagged as gang members, are encouraged to discern exactly what's possible by, by referencing disparate prototypes of power. And, embodied on this day by a successful rapper and a potential presidential nominee. Although many people hope that Obama will serve as an icon for balanced possibilities, political, personal, and social alike, gang affiliates like Jamel fit him into the narrow frame reserved for successful athletes and rappers who just want to be famous. Others, like Danny, achieve the distinction that the school administration hopes for. Still, Professional blacks, entertainers, and politicians nevertheless represent a paradoxical existence for Eastwood youth, seemingly familiar in skin color, yet fundamentally unrecognizable in future prospects. The students who taunt us articulate a struggle against the middle class morality that conceives of career day as a feasible response for, to permanent unemployment and escalating school dropout rates. Their taunts respond to the event by making respectable adults feel uneasy about swooping into their school for the day, telling them about their future, only to abscond after a few hours. There is little doubt that part of the influence that a gang leader has over a young renegade is that his commitment extends beyond a single day. A gang leader's aims are no doubt self-serving, and yet he and other leaders are a far more constant presence in the daily lives of Eastwood teenagers than successful professional blacks. Still, both gang leaders and career day speakers face resentment when attempting to socialize young urban residents. Our window hecklers offer one kind of resentment, a scornful disdain for our fly-by-night charity work. But within the gang, a second kind of resentment surfaces and is symbolized through the refashioning of gym shoes. This is how young renegades establish their own brand of political belonging during moments of political and economic transition, moments that proved to be confining.
when I told Danny a few weeks earlier that I wanted to interview him for my research project, I never dreamed that the majority of our conversations would take place in the juvenile detention center. I've been waiting here for an hour, largely unnoticed. As I scan the room, my eyes meet a guard's, and he, greets, and he views me suspiciously. His glare is ironic, standing in striking contrast to the diverted eyes of the inmates who never notice your face at the juvenile detention center. Upon entering the facility, everyone is issued the same uniform, dark gray khakis, a green t-shirt, and in the winter, a green sweatshirt as well. The clothes come in different sizes, but these garments all fix a person's status as inmate. As the confines of plexiglass encasements become home, these kids have only to look around to be reminded that they are incarcerated. That is, unless they look down. When teenagers are arrested and sent to the detention center, they are stripped of everything except the shoes they are wearing when they arrive. Because the county can't afford to equip each new arrival with new shoes, inmates keep the ones they were they keep uh, they keep wearing the ones they were arrested in until their trial date when they are either transferred to a prison or released. As a result, icebreaker conversations center on what kind of shoes you wear in your neighborhood, the number of pair you have at home, and the type of shoes you plan to buy when you get out. By now, I'm aware of the characteristics of shoe talk in the juvenile detention center and beyond. So when I spark a conversation with Danny during his visitation period, I begin by mentioning the brand of sneakers he is currently wearing. At least you came in here with some new Tims. They gotta be giving you some respect, right? Could have been worse, he says playfully. My friend Scooter got arrested in flip-flops. <laughs> so how you doing, I ask. Not so good, not good at all. My lawyer says they're trying to move my charges up to attempted murder, he says. I pause for a moment to receive the blow. I don't know what to say since the case against Danny seems so devastating. The circumstances of his arrest are as follows. One day, Danny was walking his girlfriend Tasha home while holding his gang leader Kimo's gun. Leaders like Kimo often roam, without gun roam the streets without drugs and guns because the police recognize them and subject them to, to random searches. Plus, if a minor like Danny is caught with contraband, he will receive less time. As Danny walked, he noticed that the squad car was tailing him so he asked Tasha to pretend to drop her cell phone to see if the gun was visible from behind. She agreed and confirmed that the handle was protruding from the small of his back. Danny kept walking, hoping the cops would drive away. But when the couple stopped at Tasha's doorstep, he realized that the officers were quickly approaching, so he took off running. Danny rounded a corner and threw Kimo's gun over a fence. The gun, which had a broken safety, discharged as it hit as it hit the ground. It is this event that threatens to ratchet up his charges from gun, to, from gun possession to attempted murder. The prosecution claims that Danny was shooting at the police. Ironically enough, the sound of the gun blast made Danny think the police were shooting at him, so he kicked it into high gear and, and ducked through an alleyway. He escaped to his older brother's apartment. The next day, Danny got word that Kimo was looking for him. He and the other leaders wanted to meet. During the conference, Kimo explained that the incident the day before had already brought unwanted attention to his drug operation and that as a result, the rival gang was profiting and he was losing money. He told Danny that he must face sanctions. The burly Kimo landed a swift right hook to the side of Danny's face. Then pleased with his exercise of brawn, Kimo looked towards his team and began to snicker. With Kimo's back turned, Danny grabbed a pipe and told his fellow gang members to stand down. He walked backwards until he reached the sh shelf and exchanged the pipe to, for another one of Kimo's guns, pointing it at the owner. You run now, and it'll be 10 times worse when we catch you, Kimo ranted. But Danny didn't listen. He backpedaled through the garage, reached the street, and ran feverishly as he had the day before. Only this time, he dashed to the house of his best friend, Cook. His confidant explained that the police had been at Danny's home and school with the warrant. He advised Danny to turn himself in. With the police and the gang after him, Danny took his friend's advice, but with a caveat. 
Before hitching a ride to jail, the young renegade borrowed Cook's brand new boots. He knew what to expect inside the detention center. My conversations with Danny at the detention center exemplify the social constraints under which young gang members struggle in the contemporary moment. In this context, shoes symbolize the renegade's precarious balancing act. On the one hand, young gang members are viewed as disloyal to the gang. But on the other, it is not as if this dissidence improves their life's conditions or permits them to reach a middle class standing. Instead, renegades are stuck, running from law enforcement to their gang leader's garage, only to flee back into police custody and return to the juvenile detention center, where mass incarceration lends a more pointed meaning to the mass production of their footwear. We've learned that it's easy to criticize young gang members and their obsessions with shoes. The experts who circulate in Eastwood all seek to understand how these kids can spend so much time literally staring at their feet. They are, the comparisons abound. When I was your age, many scholars and guards and preachers no doubt think, I picked up trash and marched in picket lines. These kids, by contrast, are utterly confounding, self-obsessed and directionless to boot. Their bearing, tough yet lackadaisical, suggests that their current decision to sell drugs is a matter of personal choice alone. Indeed, they seem willfully ignorant of the larger forces that have led them to hustling on the corner or into the confines of the juvenile detention center, as if their gang shift into increasingly diffuse factions is not linked to an era of mass incarceration. And yet, as I overcome my desire to shake these teenagers into reality, I see that Red Walker and Mr. Otis have the same blind spots. The history of the gang that these longstanding members acknowledge also erases key social and historical processes that have transformed the ways traditional membership is experienced. When the gang is perceived as less political or less profitable than it once was, the focus of attention, and especially the blame, falls on the attitudes, orientations, and behaviors of those not yet locked up for large periods of time often the youngest members, who older members view as key to the gang's future. This is how gang leaders and jail guards, Bible study instructors, and well-meaning professors alike fail to understand the young urban poor. We don't deem their jailhouse conversations as worthy of reflection. We don't see these conversations as ripe with nostalgia and historical consciousness. We don't see how they speak to the anxieties of living in society that contains no feasible fulfillment for your hopes and desires. But at the West Side Juvenile Detention Center, I hear these kind of conversations on a daily basis as young renegades fashion their future out of what little material they have left. Them Air Force Ones, Scooter says as I'm about to leave for the day. He's inspecting my black Nikes, scrutinizing the green and yellow highlights. I hesitate because I know the make, but not the model of my footwear. I would check the tongue, but I don't want to seem insecure. <laughs> nah, man, those are some dunks, Danny says, saving me. Everybody on my block rocks them. Those are cool, he says, eyes still glued to my feet. But as soon as I get out, I'm going to cop them new Jordans. Scooter smiles and nods. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Well, we now have time for questions. Oh, thanks so much for your presentation. I oh, really appreciate the work. When you talk about renegade sets here in Chicago, oh, I was wondering in your work if you came across some of the gays that actually formed their own sets from leaving the main set. So what, what we're seeing in a lot, of t a lot of places is that with the drug trade, particularly heroin, when it bifurcated gang sets, some of those crews formed their own sets. And now they operate with the block to block propensity and opposed to set allegiance. And I was wondering if you ran across that in your work. Yeah. I did. I, I think that's part of the larger issue in, in my work um, that I try to think around mass incarceration and what that does. 
uh, to, to the gang structure and how gang members perceive of it. Um, because in a very real sense, um, what mass incarceration has done, part of it is um, about kind of amassing um, evidence on the police's part to um, get leaders, right? And so leaders become arrested for long periods of time, and that becomes a way that the kind of exponential growth of these gang sets um, come into being and form, right? And so part of this, this idea of the renegade, I think, is precisely tied to the issues that you're talking about, in which at this historical moment, um, the way that the open air market works is that it has to continually reproduce itself, and it's always changing leadership, and it's always um, bifurcating in that way, that then people with a long history of the gang often resent and talk about and, and it, it has largely to do with their place in the community and their place in the gang being displaced, right? Um, this might be like offhand, uh, but I'm wondering kind of like your discussion about uh, like nostalgia. How does that tie into like ideas about like historical trauma and like how these, uh, how these groups of people are talking about, you know, you got your old heads and you got the younger sets. Like how does the idea behind like historical trauma play into the way they understand like nostalgia? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, nostalgia it it, uh, it it has that that idea of trauma embedded in it in a way. Part of it is because of these issues that we're talking about now. It's about trying to come to terms with um, community change and the and the fact that the community can't reproduce itself in the way that is familiar to your, to to once self in a very real structural way. Um, but um, I, I thought about kind of a framework of trauma, a framework of kind of melancholy, because that is, that is part of it, right? And these are kind of historical emotions. But there's also something else to it where there's, there's also a pride to which, how you remember as well, right, that I think nostalgia gets me towards, right? So it's not, it's not just about trauma, but it's also about um, remembering the fun uh, that you had as, as forming your identity as a gang member and lamenting the fact that you can't get that feeling back or something like that. So it's trauma, but it's also a pride contained in it. And it's, a, it's two sides of the coin that people use when they talk about this long history of the gang. Yeah, I, I want to know if you can reflect on your um, your experiences in school settings, actually inside of the school building, um, compared to your experiences inside of the detention center. And tell me, or give me your thoughts about the differences and similarities. Um. I mean, I think the striking, the striking thing about those two spaces, uh, for me, uh, and even just reflecting on the context in which I went to school, um, high school in Atlanta, uh, it's the, the similarity between the two spaces, right? So the, so the school is heavily policed. Like, I mean, from metal detectors to basically police inside the school, and just things like, you know, the, the disciplining of just bodies, like if, if you're not, the, the fact that you have to clear the hallway and, and at a single time and the, the backlash that can, you know, rain upon you if you don't do that, right? The, the first thing that strikes you in the school uh, or the schools that I, was, that I, you know, visited on the west side was just the disciplinary nature of it, right? That was um, like a juvenile detention center. And, and so, you know, juvenile detention center, um, unfortunately, uh, one of the officers once joked in a joking way said that this is a kind of, uh, his, his term, audition house for adult jail, right? So the, the idea is that these kids in juvenile detention center are, are are going to go to jail, are going to go to prison, right, naturally. But in a way, you could see that the disciplining in the school 
prepares you for life in the juvenile detention center as well, right? And, and the same kids, um, like Danny in this paper, um, that wasn't a, a, a kind of a one-off issue. You would see them circulate in both spaces, right? Uh, and so, I mean, the most striking thing is, I, I think, the similarities between the two spaces. Uh, so as, as I heard it, you focused this talk on how nostalgia can work to create tensions or at least difference between generations within Eastwood. So you know, it's easy to blame uh, younger gang members, the renegades, for problems. But I was wondering if you could say something about transgenerational solidarities within the neighborhood. The ways, despite you know, pointing fingers at kids these days, uh, the older gang members or older community members sort of look out for, for others if there's perhaps solidarity versus tension at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Um, is it kind of solidarity, um, as one might expect, often comes when it's an issue that is not necessarily gang specific but kind of community specific. Like um, in, in the book, I talk a lot about development and efforts to kind of redevelop the neighborhood and the community, right? And there you really see the kind of kind of cross-generational solidarities because it's in, uh, uh, people are very savvy, even from the older generation, of how a kind of discourse of the dangerous community is being uh, deployed to uh, develop the neighborhood, right? And what that means is that since this community is so dangerous and that people will have to leave or that we have to create a new community for you know other residents right so through the threat of displacement and dislocation you see the kind of defense of um, young gang members and and i, I even saw it in my work uh, in the context that um i would you know it, it was well known that i had a project you know, that I was working with gang members. But in the context of um, redevelopment and, and community meetings on, on the issue of redevelopment, um, it, it, there were moments where I would introduce myself to the group and say, you know, I'm a student at the time at University of Chicago. Uh, I'm working in the community and living in the community and working on this issue of uh, gang violence. Um, and people would correct me and say, well, the young people here in this space aren't gang members. They are our sons, they are our grandsons, they are our nephews. And, and so there was a kind of a way in which that uh, people would try to make sure that <coughs> with the kind of association, the label of gang wasn't going to change.